So yeah, my name is Omar Farah. If you want to say it properly, it's Omar Farah. And if you want to spell it properly, you throw an at symbol in front of it. <laughs> now, it's my, it's my second time up here on this little red dot, and I'm not any more comfortable than I was the first time. Uh, I'm an engineer in training uh, and a poet on Tuesdays. Um, so, and I've been spending a lot of my time trying to find a weird balance between these two worlds, trying to write the perfect poem that balances numerology with poetry. I almost got it. And on my quest to find this perfect little poem, uh, I stumbled upon this beautifully deep and philosophical read, Douglas Adams, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I see there's a couple nerds in the room who have also read this book before. So in this book, there's one particular passage that I want to point out where they break down the meaning of life, the answer to life, the universe, and everything. 42. For those of you who have seen it, there was an unnecessary amount of 42 related jokes that kept coming for the next 10 years, and I had a little bit of time on my hands, so I decided to dive into it, right? And I found a couple of cool coincidences, like for example, how Queen Victoria and her husband, Prince Albert, died at age 42. Coincidence, possible, true. Coincidence that they had exactly 42 grandchildren, and of their 42 grandchildren, Edward VIII abdicated at age 42. Coincidence? Possibly. Furthermore, we all found out as a people on page 42 that you're a wizard, Harry. <laughs> Is it a coincidence that the Doctor Who episode titled 42 lasts exactly 42 minutes, that three of the greatest albums of all time, ACDC's Back in Black, Pink Floyd's The Dark Side of the Moon, and Michael Jackson's Thriller all last exactly 42 minutes. Coincidence, maybe, who knows? How fast was the Titanic going before it crashed into that iceberg? 42 kilometers per hour. How old do I like my women? <laughs> I'm totally joking, I'm totally joking, I'm totally joking. Uh, but for real though, so I decided to look into it. Could these things all be coincidences? Yeah, I think so. Uh, but this theory of like 42 isn't too far off, and I decided to dive a little bit deeper into it. And I found the true meaning of life is 82. 82.14 to be exact. It's the average number of years before that line goes flat, that line you don't want to cross without your affairs intact, you know, your hugs, your kisses, and your money all stacked. It may seem like you have time, but this poem has it mapped. I'll show you how 82 is already under wraps. You see, I tried to write more than Nas and make the most out of every breath, and I don't sleep, because sleep is the cousin of, yeah, you know the rest, but we're a fragile life form, so from that 82 years we spend about a third by your bed, because you know you depend. 27 long years are spent resting your head, leaving you 55 years to live to the fullest extent. Now, feel free to fight me on this, go hard and persist, but for the first 10 years, you don't really exist. So, you have to assume that you're going to school, finish going from K to 12, which gives three years to Miss Cunningham and 42 for yourself. Meal prep, cooking, and eating as such takes about three years of your life, and I hope that you're full enough. 4.3 years, you're stuck sitting in a pencil going to and from work, because travel ain't that simple. Now money is bread, and we all got to eat, so you work nonstop, ages 20 to 65 at 40 hours a week. Some of you older folks in the audience are looking bleak. But I persist, because at least, you know, you got that vacation to Hawaii, maybe you went to Denmark, but it cost you 10.3 years working from dusk until dark. It's 2019, and my research has got enough. You spend 32 hours a month looking at a phone or a desktop. That's 3.2 years you chose to swipe right and then crop. You see, the meaning of life is that eventually it stops. Now, while you were busy adding and subtracting, trying to do the mathematics, I'm sure we all know at least one person that passed without planning. You see, eventually we are buried, or maybe turned into some ashes, and I have planned for my tomorrow, and this poem is my casket. You see, in my old home, the only certain solace was in the uncertain, faith in the afterlife, and that there's a baby coming. Old household with tin roofs held together by string, no time to really fantasize about life's pretty things. The only whispers in the wind I heard were phrases that I ain't know. Hear bad news in the room, followed by hoys saying, Ilahi haku aliyo, ama haku shifayo, ama haku gurgaro. We tried to avoid it because of ill. We don't want to have more ill. Afqoyan hadal madayo. 
But what of the tongues that are dry, the people in bad yo with no tears left to cry, hearing way hoy hoy in the operating room, with no sedative to sedate while she got a baby in the womb. Hopefully this one lasts, because the other two are in a tomb, buried in the land, not of the free, but not enslaved. Our home, away from home, where you could run and still be brave, where freedom came in the form of a bullet, or maybe it was a plane ticket, where it's an accomplishment if 82 is your digit, because in Somalia, it's 55. In Nigeria, it's 54. Make the most of your 82 because it is 50 in Sierra Leone. The fact that we are here right now is more than enough. The real privilege you have is in the place that you were born, a place that has roads, a place where you live this long into the poem. So if you have that opportunity to kiss your loved ones, hold them, tell them goodbye, kiss your mother if you still can and don't hold back, and don't retreat until you've calculated the square root of 6,725. And even then, don't you retract, because the meaning of life is 82. 82.14, to be exact. Thank you. Stop it, stop it, stop it. So, uh, in my time, uh, I get to go around to a lot of cool different places from Sometimes it'll be like an office gathering, a community gathering. I get to go to prisons a little often. I get to go to high schools, junior highs, you name it. And I get to meet a lot of people after I do this. You know, people come up to you, they have some questions, and I try my best to give them the, you know, nice intellectual answer that they're expecting from me afterwards. And this one time, this little girl named Aisha came up to me, and I just finished talking at her school, and she had a very, like, cute, like, deep, but, like, dumb question. And she asked me, Mr. Omar, do you love poetry? And then I looked at her, and I gave her an unnecessarily deep answer that was kind of basically the premise of this entire talk that I'm giving you. And I'm hoping one day maybe she might see this and be like, this is deja vu, or I remember that, or I did that. But I told her, no, I don't love poetry. And then she ran to all of her friends and was like, he's a fraud, he's a fraud. But I wasn't really lying. Poetry to me is my means, my means to an end almost. If I was to, for example, give you, Mr. If I give you $50,000, what would you do with it today? I'd buy a new car. Buy a new car. Cool. Someone else at this table as well. What's something else? What would you do if I gave you $50,000 and you had to spend it today? Ooh, I think I would go maybe go back home and do something. Go back home and do something. That's a lot better of an answer than yours, I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, so we love the things that money can do for us. Maybe we love the car that it can buy, the purse that get, that jacket that might have been $100, a little too much that you, you know, would have got. Or maybe you take a trip back home to see your loved ones and things like that. We love what the money can do. It's a tool. It's a means to an end. And that's how I see my poetry, my writing. It's how I choose to inspire, to bring about change, to express my love, to critique the world, to embrace things of that nature. It is a mechanism, just as my voice is, same way how your voice is and your voice, and your voice, and your voice, and whoever out in the universe is watching this right now. Point being, our voice, your speech, doesn't necessarily hold more weight than mine does. Someone in this room might have a louder voice than mine, but that's all good. We all have the equal opportunity to spread a certain message, to tell a certain tale. And I believe that spoken word is my form, but dialogue specifically is one of the greatest powers that we all have. See, I come from Somalia, as you might have guessed. And in our culture, we are known amongst other Africans, a little inside thing, uh, we're known as the nation of poets. Meaning, because back in the day, whenever two tribes had a problem with one another or a beef, before the men and women would pick up their swords, each tribe would send over their best poet to the front lines. They would say their piece, they say their piece. It was like a historic like, rap battle almost type of thing with super duper high stakes. And the winner would take all. Not a drop of blood would be shed, truly believing that the pen is mightier than the sword. And I believe that this is something that we should try and go back to. Because I feel like dialogue truly is the first step to solving a lot of the world's problems that we have right now. And we have more means today than we ever did to communicate with one another. Had I told my grandpa that there's a tool right now that exists that lets me get a thought from up here to my thumbs to across the ocean where my aunt is in a horn of Africa in a matter of a second, you'd think I was crazy. And that same tool is what a group of students used in Egypt to overthrow an oppressive regime. Same thing in Tunisia, same thing in Libya, and thus the Arab Springs. 
Conversation really is something that has an immense power that we have more than often forgotten because we don't have any great orators that we can kind of point to nowadays. It costs like $200,000 to get Michelle Obama to come and talk for you. We don't have any more Maya Angelou's. Marcus is gone, Martin is gone, Malcolm is gone. We don't have anyone who can move a nation simply by the prowess of their speech. And I'm trying to bring that back. Not just me, but like, you know, a lot of people. <laughs> and more than that, we've gone on, more often than not resorting to just technology to solve our problems, or we just throw money at it until it goes away. There was a man by the name of Jeffrey Sachs, uh, and he was a cool dude. I hope to meet him one day. Uh, he had the idea. He said, we can eradicate poverty entirely in our lifetime. Cool. Now, he's not just like some bong, banging, tree-smoking hippie who was like saying all this good stuff. He was a Harvard professor, worked alongside the UN, the director of the Earth Institute of Columbia, just credentials out the wazoo. And so when people of his stature say things like that, it holds weight. So what do we do when an old white guy says, yo, I got a way to fix Africa? Here's $120 million, go make it happen, try your best. Long story short, didn't really work out. And a lot of other people have tried very similar suits going into a country, imposing themselves in a little bit of a colonial manner, but we can push that to the side without really seeking the people who live there's advice, their stories, what are their mannerisms, how do they handle themselves, how can we help you? Don't just be like, I'm here to save you, all oh Africans, in like a weird savior manner. Discourse is very much so necessary to solve any problem, which is why when you go to any psychiatry session, the first thing that they say is, the first step to solving a problem is admitting you have one. Let's talk about it. So those of us who have a means to spread a story, a means to have someone else's voice heard, in this room, there's someone whose voice in here can reach more people than I can. And I feel that it is your duty and our duty to mankind to help the cries that are often the most silenced to be heard. Which is why on that note, having been given this beautiful platform, I would like to bring light to a tale that has already kind of passed our 24-hour news cycle. I'd like for everyone in the room right now to imagine that you're sitting in a movie theater. The lights dim, the credits roll in, and you hear the intro music. And it sounds something like, whoop, whoop, that's the sound of the police. Whoop, whoop, that's the sound we don't need. You see, I recorded it on my iPhone 6S so they would believe what I've seen. They took his power, his rights, and they chose to exceed. You see, the boundaries that they abide by are only there to mislead. He'll get back, get back, you're interfering with the scene. And they kept bashing at my brother until he had no blood left to bleed. You see, it doesn't matter if you are short, big and tall, or dealing with special needs. They won't discriminate on a beating if your melanin level exceeds a threshold that they donate. So it's impossible to succeed. You see, your job is to give me the benefit of the doubt, but off the doubt, he chose to benefit. He figured target practice with real bodies and they started acting negligent. He was coughing and he was crying and I was begging for them to stop. I said, I got this on camera, but he said, nah, we'll just crop. Their idea of a throwback on a Thursday are us hanging from the treetops. Blood on the leaves, but no Yeezy to make it hip hop. You see, their shots are in abundance. Their vices are an indulgence. See, I'm in an emergency asking who am I to call without police getting involved. I'm asking who am I to call when the police are doing wrong. I'm asking who am I to call when the police are breaking the law. You see, because Sandra Bland got her mug shot. While Mike Brown just got his mug shot, Eric Garner had to be choked out and they kept going until his lungs stopped and I'm only naming you the obvious because the full list hasn't even been dropped. Every cop nowadays walks around with a tatted teardrop but a white boy, no offense, can walk into a church and take about nine black lives that mattered. And they'll just walk him out by the hand like, nah, it's a misunderstanding. But you see, when 1,134 young black men were killed in 2015, 2016 been ended, but the tally still hasn't been seen with shots like these. They're putting numbers on the boards like Magic and Kareem. Shots are out of my mind. This has got to be the dream of sick MMO. I don't add the RPG because their call of duty is not just the game that's on the screen. They're hating on my pigment and hating all on my color, but tanning out in the summer to get a little bit darker. They'll say we look suspicious when our hands are in our pockets. They'll say he was resisting, so you know I had to sock him. They'll say he had a license, but we ain't know for a fact. But that's a question you ask a brother before you attack, before the eye can't breathe, and then there's no going back. So I say no justice, no peace, and no racist police. But I feel they won't stop till most of us here deceased. We love to yell out Black Lives Matters like it's a slogan at a speech, but we're branding it like a movie. 
It's the new hype and coming attraction. Rated PG-13 and brought to you in closed captions. The new cinematic feat, starring Leonardo as the black Adante Rakish. Samuel Jackson is in it, of course. He's the one hating on the black kids. It's directed by Tarantino, so you know it'll be a classic. And the outro music to this movie was a banger. Here's how it happened. It was like, whoop, whoop, that's the sound of the police. Whoop, whoop, that's a sound we don't need. And they go, whoop, whoop, you till you're down on your knees, yelling, whoop, whoop. Another hashtag on my feed. Thank you.